I love Abraham. I love the, 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 he's the only, only father that I know of that God asked him to sacrifice his own son. And he's willing to do it. And uh, he was a, he was a, a, a Christian, uh, or as we call it, but it, of course he belonged to God. And uh, he knew that, and what a blessing it was that he did belong to God. So he could, I was, I was going to turn back here to chapter 15 and read you something. Verse 6, it says this, And he believed in the Lord, and he believed in the Lord. And, and I'm in Genesis, I should have told you that. And he counted it to him for righteousness, the Lord did. And he counted it to him for righteousness. That's, that's, we're going to be in chapter 22. So you go to chapter 22 and we'll start out there. And I don't know where all we'll end up, but we'll start out there, okay? I, I just uh, love to read about Abraham. Was he perfect as far as sinless? No. But he was, he was a good father and a good servant. He was the only person in the Bible, the only man in the Bible, that three times in the Bible, God said he was a friend of God. He was a friend of God. And uh, I'm sure we have a friend that sticks us closer than a brother, a friend that loves us all time, the Lord Jesus Christ. But he didn't say anything about the others. He didn't say that they was a friend of God. But Abraham is, I'm sure that there have been others that was friends of God too. But let's just, just ask God to speak to us through the lesson. God, we ask now that you will give us that, uh, that liberty, that insight through the Holy Spirit as he speaks to us, that we might proclaim the word that you want us to proclaim. And we pray for that soul that's not saved. And we pray for those that just need to hear from God today and those that need to realize what a blessing it is to be in this family. And I'm so glad he was thinking of me when he went to the cross. It was that he was on, or we was on his mind at all times. And thank you for that. And thank you for not only thinking of us, but sending the sweet Holy Spirit and somebody to share the precious word with us so that we might be born into the family of God and washed by the blood of God and can cleanse daily by the blood of God. And we pray now for each need to be met through the precious word of God. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't believe we can find a, a better example of a faithful father in the Bible than Abraham. He's supposed to be the father of our faith and so forth and on and on. Uh, but we see all this thing. Let's read verses beginning chapter 22. We'll read a few verses here, okay? And said, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt, test, if you want to put that to a word. God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. That's, isn't that wonderful when God speaks to you that you can, you, you know that he's speaking to you through the Holy Spirit of God. And you know it's from God because it lines up with the word of God. And Abraham, they, then God spoke directly to him, of course, at times. And, but he was, he was so sensitive to the voice of God and so sensitive to the word of God that he said, here I am. I'm right here. I'm not far off. I'm right where I should be, okay? And he said, take now thy son. Now, he said, thy only son. This is the only one that God recognized. Isaac was one he recognized. He, didn't, he did not recognize Ishmael because they went out of the will of God with the handmaid, Hagar, to, to have this son, and he did not recognize it, him at all. Whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. He didn't wait to few days or a week or so to make it uh, see if he wanted to do this early in the morning saddled his ass and took two of these young men with him Isaac his son and clave the wood uh, for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off 
And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. What did he say? He didn't say he was coming back by himself. He said, look at what he said, and worship and come again to you. We'll be back. And Abraham took the wood from the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. Uh, and they went, both of them, together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I my son and he said behold the fire the wood but there where is the lamb for a burnt offering and Abraham said these are, these are great words right here my son God God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering so they went both of them together and they came to the place which God had told him of and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood on in the order and then bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood he didn't resist a thing it never said that Isaac resisted it said that he didn't understand but he said God was going to provide him, himself an altar, uh, a sacrifice and Abraham stretched forth his hand he's ready to fillet this young man uh, and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know, I know, God said, that thou fearest God, see, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. What a testimony. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham, Jesus Christ is your stead, you know. God uh, sent his son to be instead of you. And Abraham called the name of that place, Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to the day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. What a, what a blessing, what a wonderful blessing that we can have. What a message we get from all this. It didn't start here. He didn't start just obeying God here. It started from the time he was saved. He left his country when God told him, and we'll read about that. First a promise, he said here, and you know in, in verse 2, and said, Take now thy son and the love of and to the land of Moriah, and him therefore a burnt offering upon the mountains which I will tell thee of. A burnt offering. A possession he talked about. And of course he's, he's talking about uh, his son. His only son. This is not just anything. This is his only son. He would have given any of his animals up easily. But this takes the grace of God and the power of God to be willing to lay down his only son. Then he goes on to say, passion. There had to be passion there. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave, uh, clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. What passion, what care, what God had done for them. These are something. He's, you know, God has called us for a reason in this. It's not just to do anything. We are to picture our Father in heaven, fathers. We, you're called a Father for a reason. You're to be an example of the Father in heaven. Your characters should reflect Him. I know we can't be just like God the Father in heaven, but we can be a whole lot more like Him than what we are. And each year we should make that point in our life. I want to be more like him. I want to be more like him. I want to represent the Father in heaven to my children so that they'll know that the Father in heaven is a wonderful Father. 
And I know that because if you reflect his, his ways and his will and his work, I promise you they'll see Jesus Christ in you. And they'll know that. And it's done with the love of God that's shed abroad in your heart. You say, I love my children. God does too. You say, I love my children. If you love them so much, then you'll want the very best for your children. And the very best for your children is that they might be saved as early as possible in life and live that life for the rest of their life and serve God. That's the very best for your children. And we're to reflect the Lord Jesus Christ, reflect the Father in heaven. That's why we have that name. As I said before, children are to obey their fathers, but father is not to bring them to wrath and scream and holler at them like they're some kind of animal or something. That's not the way it's done. I have never heard my father in heaven speak to me like that. That's the reason he tells us. God help us to be the fathers that God wants us to be. I'll tell you something, and it's not for me or nothing, but Dale used to follow me around. If I turned around, I'd step on him. Everywhere I went in the church or anywhere else when I wasn't preaching, he'd follow me around. He never said a word to nobody. He wouldn't talk to nobody. He had two people in the church he'd speak to when he was a little boy. He'd speak to Mrs. Uh, Coburn. He just loved that elderly lady. And he'd speak to the pastor's wife. That's the only two people he talked to. The rest of them, he just grunted. And then I said, won't you say something? He said, I don't want to. That's all he'd say, I don't want to. And he never did. He never was much about talking. Some of you know him well enough to know that. But he always followed me around everywhere I went. And it tickled him to death to be with me. And I tried to spend as much time as I could with him. I'm not talking about But one day a lady asked him, said, asked Dalma, she didn't ask him, asked Dalma, said, does Dale think his daddy's God? Said, everywhere he goes, he's right with him. She said, no. But said, he represents God for him. And I tried to do that, but I failed him many, many ways. And you do too. But we don't have to. We can be a better father this year than we was last year. We can be a better father tomorrow than we was today. If we want to really be to what God wanted. Father's faith in God. That's the first thing we see. There's first five verses are we see there. He, he believed God. He just believed God. I just read it to you over in chapter 15. It, it very plainly tells us that he believed God. And that's what it's all about. Is believing God and surrendering to him and doing what God wants us to do. It's a wonderful thing to believe God. God says, have faith in God, of course. And if you're not saved, you'll never be a father that you're supposed to be. And if you don't live a Christian life after you're saved, you'll never be the father you should be. It's not just getting saved one day and say, that's it. Remember what I said? He said, he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Over in James, in chapter uh, in James, I know I've got it down. James chapter 2 and verse 23. He, another verse that God talked about uh, him believing God and uh, counted to him for righteousness, righteousness. And that's what, the, how about you? I heard a lot of people say they believe in God, but they don't live for him. The devil believes in God. The devil believes in God. When you believe in somebody and you love somebody, you reflect them, what they want you to do. And it's important. Chapter 2 and verse 23 in James it says, And the scriptures was fulfilled which saith, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. And he was called the friend of God. You know, I believe all of us are friends of God that reflect God and do what he wants us to do as children of God. And he wants us to be. He obeyed God. Verse 4, back in our text, he said he obeyed. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. 
He's going there. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here uh, with the, the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Fathers, he obeyed God. He became a friend of God. I just read that to you. And 2 Chronicles 27 says he was friend forever. Not sometime, but forever he was a friend. In Isaiah 41, 8, God said, Abraham, my friend, my personal friend. That's what we all want to be, friends of God. Then we'll be the servants that we should be, and we'll be the fathers that we should be. Father's faith in God. Where's your faith today? Where is your faith today? What kind of faith do you believe God? You say, sure, I believe God. If you believe God, you'll live for God. I, I have trouble on this thing. And you know, a lot of people say I'm saved. They never want to go to church. They never want to serve God. They never, and, and, but I don't need to go, they say. That's not what the Bible says. I don't need to serve God as a father. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible tells us very plainly not to forsake the assembly. Now, we'll have to spread out here. I know that. That's a little awkward to everybody. But there's one thing about it. It's this place where we can come and worship God today. And we can learn a little bit more about him. And I thank God for it. Abraham, my friend, Abraham, my friend, he said. Father's fellowship with God. And, and you see that back in our text in verse 1. What a great fellowship he had with God. And it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. He's pretty close to him, wasn't he? He was right there where he could hear that voice at any time. And that's the way we should be. The Holy Spirit should be so sensitive to us that when God asks us to do something or asks us to go somewhere or asks us to show somebody or tell somebody else about him, that we wouldn't have any hesitation. I'll hear you, Lord. I'll do it, Lord. If that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. That's what, you know, that's what happened. I was talking about Isaiah there a while ago, Isaac was. He's talking about his, first he found out, you know, about everybody else's fault. And then he found out when he saw the Lord, how dirty and filthy he was. And he said he was the same way. He needed the Lord too, and so forth, and cleaned up. We all need that. He hears the voice of God. Do you hear the voice? Would you know the voice of God in your heart if he spoke to you? I've heard people tell me that God told me to do this, and it was, it was so far away from the scriptures that it wasn't nothing about God. It was something they wanted to do. It's something they decided in their own hearts that they was going to do. God had nothing to do with it because it wasn't biblical. But nothing about it biblical. Be sure it lines up with the scriptures when that voice speaks to you. And if it doesn't line up with the scriptures, you better run as far away from you can. That's what Mark showed us this morning in, over in, in, uh, in, in, in our scriptures this morning, how that we're, we're to get away from some of that stuff, and not be around it, and get away from the evil things and tells us how to do that and all that. And that's the way it should be. We don't need that. Flee from the very presence of uh, the old devil, and of course, and then resist him, and he'll flee from you. What a what a savior and God we have. We thank God that we can have it. And we'll see if I can get this thing opened up here where I can get it going. How he how he yes, he knew the worship of God in verse five. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. We come in to worship God, and we leave to serve God. But we need to know how to worship God. It's not just open your mouth one day and say, I'm going to worship God. Worship God starts in your heart. And if it's not in your heart, it's not going to be worship. Sometimes we see how quick we can get through it. I want to get over it and go on out of it. Worship is a, is a time with the Lord to worship him in your heart, not with your mind, 
but to worship God in your heart. We talked about that last week, how that we need to give our hearts to the Lord on Wednesday, I think it was. Worship requires sacrifice. It requires a sacrifice. And God wants your time. He wants your talent. He wants your treasures. He doesn't take it all from you. He gives you plenty of time to work or labor, whatever you have to do. But he wants your time and you've got a talent that he wants. God give everybody a talent to do something. We will have two men stand at the door when you go out here and they're going to direct you and everything and they're going to take up all your money if you get it all out and empty it out and we'll get to that too. But anyways, that's as important as what I'm doing up here. Little is much when God's in it. If you're doing it for God, it's a whole lot. God, he doesn't measure how big it is. He measures how your heart is when you do it. Where is your heart? That's what God measures. Thank God. That's when you don't have to be like somebody else. You don't have to be in a position of somebody else. He wants time. Give him time. Give him the first part of your day. Start with him. Not only start with him, but end with him. Marty, I saw you woke me up at 3 o'clock this morning. Come in my room. So I couldn't go back to sleep. It's forever before I went back. When I went back to sleep, it's time to get up. So, but anyways, while I was not asleep and so forth, I had time to pray and talk to God. Then I flipped that old television on. And I thought I'd, I'd, it'd make me go to sleep. So I just flipped it off. It didn't do that either. But I had time with God. His time. He said, that's my time now. Okay, and your talents. I don't have a whole lot of talents. I know that I don't. But I do know who has. And he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God didn't call you to do something that he won't give you the ability to do it. But the greatest ability is availability. Be available. Here am I, Lord, send me. That's what Isaiah said. He didn't say, I want to know where you're sending me. I want to know what I'm going to be doing. I want to know how long I'm going to stay. He didn't say that. Here am I, Lord, send me. That's what Isaiah said. What did, what did Abraham say? Go back to Genesis chapter 12 with me just a minute, okay? Genesis chapter 12. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing we see here and what God has done here. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that's all right. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, then it was, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father. I want you to leave everybody. I want you to leave everything. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. It goes on to say, I will bless them that bless thee. I'll tell you one thing, you better stay close to Israel too. And curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I think the story of Abraham that anybody can be blessed if they read it as a Christian and see what Abraham has done. I've got a biography of Abraham and all. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. He departed. He went out. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and 5 years old. That's pretty old to be taken off on a journey. Look what he goes on to say. And Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and their substance and they had, that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haram and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land and goes on to time. But he told him to go out. He, he didn't know exactly what was going to happen. He just followed God's obedience and went what he wanted. It's important. He loves God above family. 
He left everything there, his father and all of his kin folks are except his brother's son. That's all. He left it all. When God asks you to move, make a big move or something, it's not to hurt you. It's not to cause you problems. It's because it's the greatest thing you can ever do is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's wonderful. It is truly wonderful to follow God. I left West Virginia in 1957. I said, I'll never come back to West Virginia. All I ever knew was poverty. We were very poor as 10 of us kids. Dad worked in the mines when he was working and all. He gave us what he could. But we was all going to go out, and as young as I was 16, I was going to go to school, I was going to get me a car, I was going to get this and all these things. Little did I know, you know, what God had in mind for my life then. I didn't know. But I just went out to get away from everything. But when I come back to West Virginia in 1976, in August of 76, I come back to West Virginia, I knew what I was coming back for. I didn't know what was going to happen. Didn't know I was going to have a priest. Didn't know none of that. But I knew that God wanted me in West Virginia. Beyond the shadow of a doubt. Well, I didn't have to convince them when she'd been wanting to come back for the last 15 years. She always wanted to come home. But I come back to West Virginia. I had no idea what God was going to do in my life. But I knew I belonged in West Virginia. And God began to work in our lives and got us into a good church then the school a little while and all that. But it's wonderful to follow God. I'm telling you it is. He loves God above family, left her above friends, above his own son, Isaac, only son. <coughs> he gave him up. Was going to give him up, let's put it that way. It's a blessing. But follow God. And you can follow him according to the word and the Holy Spirit of God. That's why we, we just really believe that this is God's work that he's doing now. But he's tempting us or testing us. He can't tempt nobody. But it's the testing. And every time we go through a testing, we should get stronger to God. We should be closer to God. Our faith should grow. Every time there's a testing, it's not wondering why this all happened. I don't know why, do you? I don't know why there's, there's people in good churches that uh, have this thing hit them hard. I have no idea. I've got friends that you know that this thing hit them hard. I don't want to see it happen here. But we're going to do everything we can to make sure it doesn't happen here. I don't want to see one of you get that stuff. But God knows what's best. But I pray to God when we come through this. I used to, lady, I used to go have and pray for me before I go to the surface mine on Monday morning. I worked night shift and stayed up there. I'd go to this elderly lady's house. She had cancer. And I'd always go to her house and pray with her. And I'd, I'd ask her, I'd say, would you pray that, you know, God will give me a church sometime before I die? And she said, this, this too shall come to pass. She said, this too shall come to pass. I can hear her say it now. She's in heaven, bless her heart. And by the way, she lived long enough to come up to the little church that God had given me here. And she played the piano for us that night. She loved to play the piano. She was our piano player at Mount Jackson. This too shall come to pass. Can I tell you this this morning? Just as sure as I'm sitting here, this too, this pandemic we're in today, it will come to pass. I promise you it will come to pass. Now we're to do what we're supposed to do. We're not to be ignorant about things. God didn't, he, he, listen, he didn't want to, he talk, same way about the, when he's talking about the rapture of the church, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. God doesn't want us to be ignorant about this pandemic either. He wants us to do the things that we know that can help prevent it. We don't want our people to get in this. This too shall come to pass. Father's favor with God. Look what he says. In chapter 18, if you're good over with me, and, and, and verse 18 and 19, okay? Chapter 18. I'm back there in 15. I don't want to get back there. Chapter 18. Verses 18 and 19, okay? Here's what God says. 
seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and that all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Can you imagine that? And all the nations in this earth has been blessed by Abraham. Look what he goes on. For I know him, I know him. By the way, he knows you. He knows me. He knows our heart and everything that's in our heart. He knows us. You can't hide anything from God. You might not want him to know it, but he knows it. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. He's going to raise his children the way he should. Good on. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. That's two of the greatest verses you'll ever find about a father. I love what, you know, over there in Joshua said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I love that too. That's a beautiful word. But this is, this is a bless. This is from God. God spoke this. What's he saying about you and me? What does he say about you and me? Father's favor with God. He received his son as promised. 90 and 100 years old. She was 90 and he is 100. Then we're reading something in the paper this morning a little bit. And this, this man was... I'm not sure what he was. One was 100 and one was 107. One, either he was 107 and she was 100. They getting married. That's pretty old, isn't it? I thought to myself, surely he doesn't learn better than that by now, you know. But I don't know, you know. He received the country promised. His people received that country. Just like he promised. He received the blessings promised. Just like it says in these scriptures here, if you want to read and study about Abraham, you'll see that he did. God promised it, and it happened. Son that was faithful, he had a son that was faithful. Look in verse 9 back in our text now, okay? He has a faithful son. He said, I know he's going to raise him right. I know he's going to teach him right. I know he's going to take and sacrifice with him right. I know that. Look what he says in verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Can you imagine that? I don't know how old he is. I've had different people tell me about how old he was. He was just a young person, though. A young man. He received a country promised, and he received a son promised, and he received the blessings promised. And the son that was faithful, substitute was found. After he showed God, or God knew in his heart what he's going to do, he received that substitute. You know, you and I, Mark said this morning, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. We was all born sinners. Born sinners. Now there comes an age of accountability. I don't know what that is different for you young people. But there comes an age of accountability. But after that person is saved. After that person is saved. Parents you're responsible to continue to teach them. Continue to take them. Continue. Listen. This is most important. Train them in the way they should go. You don't, you don't just throw them out there. And if you do, you get in trouble. People say, well, if I take them to church, that's, that's good enough, isn't it? No, it isn't. The best training that you'll ever have in this world is in the home. That's why they said to train them and teach them. And, and, and you know, what God, and take them to church, sure. But God wants them to do that. He, God wants them to do that. Faithful. Substitute that was found. We see that in verses 8 and 13 there. He talked that. And he looked at verse 13. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket and thorns. We know that. But God sent our substitute. He tells us over in 1 John chapter 2 verse 2 it says. 
Jesus is our propitiation. He's our instead. He's, he's our mercy seat instead of us. He's instead of us. Not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. He's our mercy seat. He's our substitute. Until you know him and receive him as your personal savior, you have no idea what took place at Calvary. But the more I was talking to a young man this morning and, and I was telling him and he told me how many years that this, his life had changed and so forth. But he's talking about how sweet it is and how wonderful it is to be in the family of God. I said, I'm going to tell you something really, really deep. He kind of grinned. I just told him I was going to tell him something. It gets better. The longer you're in the family of God, the sweeter it is. There's nothing sweeter. Is it without disease, tempted, these trials and these testings that God's going to get? You're going to have them. Think it not strange that we have fiery trials. And I'm going to have to get estranged out of here too. Abraham's a good example. Read the, and you, like I said, I've got a biography of him. There's so many things wonderful about him. Satisfaction of the Father. Look in verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. God sent you a substitute there. We have that wonderful substitute. And 2 Corinthians 5 21 it tells us he who knew no sin took up on him the sins of the whole world that we might be clothed in his righteousness. What a savior. Let's stand to our feet.